Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm, uh, I'm really pleased to be back with you today. I've had a few weeks away, and uh, most of it has been uh, renovating and catching up on about 15 years of neglect on my house. Um, but we had a good week away this last week, and I'm pleased to be back here. I'm glad you're here too, and I want to uh, just welcome especially our online church family, those who are tuning in online today. Thank you for joining us as well. Now, we've been in this series called Sunday School Stories Rebooted. And uh, we've been looking over this time at uh, some of the stories, Bible stories that you may have heard as kids uh, at Sunday school. Uh, I know I grew up in Sunday school and heard a lot of these stories there. And many of them we've not actually uh, preached as adults or looked into and delved into as adults. But the whole of God's Word is true and, uh, and potent for us as uh, as as believers, as adults, it speaks to our lives, not just as children, and they're not just stories. Um, and uh, so that's why we've been studying these uh, faith stories of God's people, of God at work in people's lives. We started with Adam and Eve in the, gar- and the, in the Garden of Eden and looked at the problem of sin, which continues today. And we studied Daniel in the lion's den and how prayer connects us with God in a way that allows us to stand when all those around us would fall. You heard about Jonah and about Noah and about Samson, amongst others. And, and I want to thank those who contributed to this series along the way, because I haven't preached all of these things. And as you know, I took a few weeks holidays in the midst of it. So, uh, you know, we heard from Pastor Caleb and Pastor Jay and Larry and Gary and David. And thank you guys for, for contributing to uh, this series and to our learning and growth as a church. These are not just stories. They're not just stories. These are are real people who God worked in and through and who God invited into His story. And today we're going to take another look at one of these stories that I first learnt about when I was a young lad in Sunday school. And I can tell you right now, you're probably glad you weren't my Sunday school teacher because I wasn't the most um, uh, silent or still child. Um, But I remember a lot of the stories that were uh, taught to me back then that uh, captured my imagination and took a hold of my heart. And so, as we look at this story today, I want to uh, show you a very powerful principle that God has been teaching me and, uh, and using it in my life very recently. So, this is a very personal message for me, but it's one that I believe uh, has the power and potential to revolutionize your life if you would take hold of this principle and let it uh, be at work, let God be at work in your life through this. So, if you have your Bible with, me, with you or a, a smart device and, and uh, that Uversion app, you can turn with me to Judges chapter 6. Now, this is the story of Gideon and uh, you should not be unfamiliar with the story of Gideon because we've actually delved into uh, p- bits of his story a, a, a number of times over the last few years, over the last you know, 12 months to two years. I know Pastor Caleb has preached on Gideon and I've referred to him as well. But today we're going to continue uh, looking into Judges chapter 6 and 7 uh, and into the life of Gideon. Because although we have looked at, at him before and, uh, and you know his story, God's Word is alive and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It directs us, it guides us, it reveals truth to us. It reveals God's will for our lives and so every time we dig into God's Word, even when it's a familiar passage, it has the potential to speak to us and to change us. And so we're going to look at this again. Turn with me to Judges chapter 6 and as we look at this passage, I want to show you how it has been transforming me in uh, recent uh, weeks as well and how it can transform your life as well. You can follow along in the Version Bible app if you have that. Judges chapter 6, I'm going to read the first oh, I don't know, six or seven verses. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years, He gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because of the power of the Midianites was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites and other Eastern people invaded the country. They camped on the land, they ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with with their livestock and with their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian 
so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. You see what's happening here in this passage. It's the same old story. Israel has neglected their walk with the Lord. They have neglected the worship of their God. In fact, it says not only did they neglect God, but they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And sometimes we think the things that we do aren't so bad. In our sight, in our eyes, you know, this is okay. And no doubt that's what the Israelites thought, that what they were doing was okay. But what we read is, in the eyes of the Lord, it was evil. And so they ended up in this disastrous situation where, listen to this, where their enemy was prospering at their expense. You know, they'd raise sheep and cattle and donkeys, they would plant, um, you know, crops and and that was for their well-being. But who was getting the good out of that? Their enemies. Their enemies were prospering at their expense. In fact, this passage describes Israel as impoverished. Now, we'll come back to that word in a moment. But it's in that moment of impoverishment, in their darkest hour, in their greatest weakness and vulnerability, that they cry out to the Lord for help. Now, that is a good thing to do when you're in trouble, to cry out to the Lord for help. That is the right place to go when you are in a disastrous situation. But the question I have to ask as I look at this is, what were they doing for the last seven years? It says that this was the case for seven years. It took them seven years to cry out to the Lord for help. I don't know why they didn't do that sooner. But the truth is, we can at times all be very slow learners, can't we? When it comes to the things of God, when it comes to the things of ourselves, we can be very slow learners. Sometimes we need to go through this same process several times, the same difficulty a number of times before we begin to get it. And it was true for the Israelites and it's true for us. They repeated the same mistakes over and over and over again. You know, in many ways they had no excuse. God had revealed Himself to them as He has to us and He had promised them to be their God, to hear their prayers, to provide for them. We know the great promises of God. We know who He is. We know what He has uh, offered to us and yet time and time again we ignore Him and we go our own way and we try, try to do things in our own strength and we get stuck in the same cycles of of letting God down or of disobedience or falling into the, the trap of the evil one. God had told them over and over again that, that they could call on Him and He would deliver them. He'd see, they'd seen that happen in their own history. So what had they been doing for seven years? Well, actually, it tells us in verse 2, it tells us that they were hiding they were hiding in caves and they were trying to find safe places to live and to protect themselves. But it wasn't working. It wasn't working. All their crops and livestock were being raided over and over again by the Midianites and other um, Eastern peoples, it says, leaving them impoverished. Now, this word impoverished is an interesting word. I mean, it means to be made poor. It, it comes from the same root word as poverty. So, to be placed into poverty is what impoverished means, to be forced into poverty, which is, can I just say, just the opposite of what God has promised for His people. It's just the opposite of how God's children ought to be living. It is just the opposite of what it means to be blessed by a father who has good things for his children and gives good gifts to his children. It's just the opposite of what John 10.10 10 talks about, the abundant life, life and life to the full. It's the opposite of what the promised land was meant to be to the people who God led there. He had led them there in previous generations, they'd settled there earlier to this land flowing with milk and honey. This, what we read about in, in the beginning of uh, Judges chapter 6, is not what God's people ought to look like. And I'm not saying that we should all be living in mansions and driving sports cars, because the truth is, the blessings of God are so much more, uh, so much greater than material possessions. 
In, in fact, there is a poverty that is so much deeper than financial lack. And these people are impoverished, not just because of the oppression of Midian, but because of their rejection of God. They are not walking with the Lord. They are not experiencing His best. They are not experiencing His blessings. They have done evil in His sight. They have left His side. They have walked their own way. And so they cry out to God in their moment of impoverishment. And He sends a prophet to remind them of something to remind them of who He is and of why they're in the predicament that they're in. The prophet says to them in verse 8, says, speaking on God's behalf, he says, I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the land of the Egyptians and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live but you have not listened to me. I wonder where it is that you have not listened to God today. What is it in your life that is not going the way it ought to go because you've not listened to God? Now, this is the part in the story where we meet Gideon. And I'm not going to tell you all of his story. You can read about it yourself. Uh, Really, it covers uh, the two chapters of chapter 6 and chapter 7 in in this uh, book of Judges. But I will tell you this, Gideon is the least of the least. He is the youngest, he's the least important in his family. He's a member of the, the clan that is the, or tribe that's the smallest amongst his people. He holds no rank, no significance, no reputation. There are no notches on his belt of military victories. He has no reputation, uh, but God comes to him. You see, God is no discerner of man. Uh, God doesn't uh, come to just the important people. God doesn't just lead or speak those who have high positions. It's not just the pastors who who get to um, hear from God or, or who God lends his ear to. And God comes to him as he has come to me and as he has and will come to you. And he uses Gideon to defeat the Midianites, to win an unwinnable battle, to to liberate his people. And I want you to know today that you too can experience the victory of God in your life, in your battles, in the things that you face. God comes to Gideon and when he does it first, there is self-doubt. And there's four um, processes that Gideon goes through. And uh, if the PowerPoint catches up with me, the first one is self-doubt. Gideon, you know, he responds to this thought that, you know, I'm no one important. I'm, I'm just a little guy, I'm a warrior, I'm weak, I'm, I'm afraid, I'm, I'm hiding out in this threshing pit. There was self-doubt. When God came to him, that was Gideon's first response. I'm not your guy. And then as God reveals His plan, this self-doubt was followed by doubt in God. You see, God had already promised to to, to Gideon to deliver Midian into His hands. God had already made that promise to him. But Gideon wasn't convinced. And so he did the whole fleece thing, right? You know the fleece thing. Uh, Verse 36, Gideon says to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you've already promised... (laughs) You've already said this, but if you will, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor and if there's dew only on the fleece and all the ground around it is dry, then I'll know for sure. I'll know for sure that you're a, you know, a God of His Word, of, of your Word, that you will save Israel by my hand as you've said. Twice in that passage, he's, he says, God, you've already said this, <laughs> but, but will you prove it to me because I'm, I'm, now, I'm doubting you. And, and what he asked God to do, he did. God did it. Next morning, it says that he was able to wring a bowl full of water out of that fleece, yet all the ground around it was dry. And not being satisfied with that, Gideon still doubted God and asked him to do the fleece thing again, but this time in reverse. And again, this time, the fleece is dry and the ground around it is wet. Now, eventually, Gideon is convinced. And so this, uh, this confidence shifts to confidence in himself. He goes from a lack of self-confidence, self-doubt, 
to doubting God, to then believing God but having confidence in himself. Eventually, when he's convinced, he has this self-confidence in his own ability and the strength of his army. So this guy who was hiding out from the enemy, the weakest, the smallest, the youngest, goes from self-doubt to doubting God and then to self-confidence. And in his self-confidence, he's thinking, okay, now, well, yes, I can do this, I guess. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to need a big army, right? So he gathers the biggest army he can. He gathers together 33,000 fighters. Now, I don't know how long it took him to do that, but that's quite a feat. That's a big army. 33,000 uh, he had in his army. And if you know the story, and again, you can read it for yourself in these two chapters, God leads Gideon through this process of sending most of them home until there's just 300 left. From 33,000 strength, we're going to do this to just 300 against these eastern peoples who it says when they invaded the land, it was like swarms of locusts. And God delivers Midian into their hands. Jump over to chapter 7, uh, verse 19. Uh, we read, Gideon and the hundred men, so he's got 300, he's divided them into three groups. There's a hundred with him, there's another hundred there, and another hundred there. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. So this is the enemy's uh, encampment. Uh, just, uh, he reaches there just after they change guards. They blew their trumpets and broke their jars that they had in their hands. The three companies, so the 300 men, blew their trumpets and smashed their jars, grasping the torches in their, in their left hand and holding their right hands the trumpet that they were to blow and shout, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. While each man held his position around the camp, the Midianites ran crying out as they fled. They ran away. They fled. And finally, in this end of the story, we see how Gideon moves in his confidence from himself to a confidence in God and in God alone. And here's the mistake that Gideon made, that Israel made, that so many of the people of God that we read about in the Bible are made and that we seem to continue to make because we're proud or, or too slow to learn or, or we have this independent streak, we need to do it for ourselves. Here's the mistake that they made and I'll, and I'll get there. But in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul was pleading with God to help him out with a certain need, in the same way that the Israelites, they turn to the Lord in their point of need. Here's Paul. He's pleading to, with God for help, for relief with this certain problem. And we don't know what that problem was. It doesn't really matter. In the same way that I don't know what your problems are, and that doesn't really matter because we can bring them to the Lord, right? And so he's, he's come to the Lord. He's crying out to God for help. In verse 9, he gets his answer. And uh, this is what it says. But he, that's the Lord, said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul responds to that and he says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardship, in persecution, in difficulties. Why? For when I am weak, then I am strong. And not in my own strength, in the strength of God that rests on me. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. So this, this life, church, this is the mystery that we need to fathom. This is the principle that we need to comprehend. This, this, this is the, um, the, the, the mystery that we miss. That God delights to work in and through our weakness. God delights to work in and through our weakness, surrender to Him on our knees, in our most difficult moments, when we're ready to give up and can't see a way through, His strength is made perfect in us. Now, I know so many of you have been in those moments. Maybe some of you are now, where you feel weak and the only thing you can do is be reliant on Jesus to be the one who is stronger than I, to be your strength, Somebody needed to hear that today. You see, here's the thing. We are attracted to strength. 
we're attracted by strength. You know, we go, oh, look at that great leader. Look at what they've accomplished. We're attracted to strength, but God is attracted to weakness. He's attracted to desperation. He's attracted to those who won't make it without them. Because then they'll lean on Him. You know, it's in our, our self-sufficiency is what separates us from God so often. When we have this, I can do it, I can make it mindset. I, I don't need God. When you have that mindset, you won't have God. But when all you need is Him, then He is all you need. 1 Corinthians uh, one twenty seven says, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Don't ever be afraid of being weak, because that's when you'll get the strength of God. I know that doesn't make sense to us. We want to think that God rewards our efforts, because that's what our parents did. That's what our school teachers do. They reward our efforts. But God is a rewarder of those who are dependent on Him. God rewards obedience. God, His power is seen most perfectly in our weakness. Now, I want to share with you how God has been using this in in my life. By now, you will have heard that we are launching a Life Church campus in Harvey Bay in January. We're very excited about this. But I want you to know that it's, it's no new idea. This has been on the cards for this church. It's been a part of many, many discussions over many, many years. In fact, even former pastors of this church before me, and I've been here, I don't know, 17 years or something. Um, former pastors have talked about this. This has been an ongoing discussion. And if I'm honest, in these discussions with the board, with the staff, with key leaders in the church... Uh, at different times over the years, we've been looking forward to the right moment, the right moment in time, that, that we would be in a right position to, 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 to plan a church. The optimum time to start a new work in Harvey Bay. We were looking for the moment where we would be at our strongest as a church, so that we could launch this new, new work. And there has always been some reason why, you know, it wasn't the right time, where we we weren't quite strong enough, there wasn't enough people to help out, you know, we need to settle into our new building, we need to pay off our new building, we need to, um, you know, find more people to serve, we haven't got the finances, we've got to do this, we've got to do that. There's always been some reason why we weren't strong enough to do this in our own strength. See the mistake in that thinking? And so earlier this year, I was, I was uh, on another break, seemed to take a lot of breaks these days. Uh, I was on, on uh, a week or two off and I was in a church in Brisbane and uh, one of our pastors was preaching there and he preached on Gideon. Not the sermon I just brought you, that was fresh yesterday. Um, but he was preaching on Gideon and right at the beginning of chapter 7 of uh, Judges, Judges chapter 7, Gideon has gathered together his army of 33,000 men. He's at his strongest. And in verse 2, God says this to Gideon. Judges chapter 7, verse 2, God says, You have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel would boast against me, my own strength has saved me. And as I read that in that church service that moment, it was like God grabbed a hold of my collar and shook me and said, you wanted to do this in your strength, but I'm going to do it in your weakness. You wanted to do this in your strength, and he was right, (laughs) but I'm going to do this in your weakness. Now, I can give you a lot of reasons why we shouldn't be doing this right now. I can give you a lot of reasons (laughs) why we shouldn't be doing this right now. You know, the truth is, I don't have the strength, I don't have the energy, um, I don't have the experience or the skill to make this happen. I mean, I've got real good at, at pastoring a church of a couple of hundred. That, you know, that's, that's my niche. Um, I don't know that, that starting afresh with a small group of people in a neighbouring uh, town is, is something that I can say that I have a lot of experience in. 
And we as a church, in many ways, we're not necessarily at the strongest point in our history. I mean, the, the, the coronavirus has kind of hit us hard as a church, as it has many. Uh, we, we, we are not able to, and, you know, people are staying online and staying home, and we're not, we're not when we're together, we're not all that we actually are. And I mean, who wants to plan a church in a pandemic? That's just a crazy talk. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more about my weakness, so that Christ's power might rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weakness, in insults, in hardship. If people say, and we're being stupid doing this, you know, I don't care. <laughs> Because this is God. I delight in these things, in difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Again, not in my own strength, but in His. Because I lean on Him in that moment, and when I lean on Him, I have more than my strength, I have His strength. And so I have this great confidence in God in this moment. I have an amazing confidence in God that He will do this thing that He's calling us to do as a church. That what he wants to accomplish in Harvey Bay will be done in his strength and for his glory as we obediently follow. And so to honour you as my church family, I want to keep you in the loop and fill you in on how God is leading us in this. And so on January 17th, we will be launching our first service in Harvey Bay. It, it will be an evening service initially, uh, to, just to start with, and it'll be just like many churches treat a second morning service. You know, there's a lot of churches that because of numbers and the size of their building, they have, you know, two or even more morning services and, and the services are the same. So we're going to be treating this uh, service in Harvey Bay just like other churches treat their morning service. It'll be essentially a reproduction of our morning service. Th those who are in the key leadership roles on a Sunday morning here will be doing the same thing on a Sunday night there. And we'll do that for at least around the first six months is our hope. Uh, our intention is to move to a morning service as soon as we're able to um, up there. Now, we'll be renting out a facility in Harvey Bay. We'll be in the Harvey Bay Neighbourhood Centre in Pialba. This is fresh news today, even Pastor Caleb doesn't know this yet because I only heard um, uh, late last week. But we're renting out the um, Harvey Bay Neighbourhood Centre in Pialba, which is a lovely, a lovely space. It's got plenty of room for growth and for, um, you know, ancillary ministries to take place, like children's ministry and so on. Pretty much ideal for anything we'd ever want to do as a church. And our goal uh, will be to get established there um, as quickly as possible so that we can move to a morning service. Now, we have a number of people here, even here today, who live in Harvey Bay and who travel down here to be a part of Life Church. We have other people here today who are moving to Harvey Bay and, uh, and I've watched this happen over many, many, many years as the pastor of this church and, and so often the intention is to stay connected with us, you know, but that drive just becomes a little bit more, you know, than they want to do after some time. And uh, so, for those of you who live in Harvey Bay, who come from Harvey Bay, those online who are watching from Harvey Bay, we're bringing Life Church to you. And we've had requests for that. And in fact, just yesterday, there was an email just out of the blue. Somebody had heard that we're starting a church in Harvey Bay. Tell me more. And now, I don't know who this person is. It's probably a pastor of another church who's wondering what we're doing. Uh, but uh, they were interested to find out and uh, hopefully to become a part of the Harvey Bay Life Church. Now, I want you to know that there are those who believe in what we're doing. Uh, our district is behind us 100%. They've given us a grant of $20,000 to help us get started there. Another district who has no interest in, you know, like, it's like the states, right? The districts do their own thing. Uh, one of our other districts, Victoria, they've given us $5,000 because they believe in what we're doing. And there are other churches, actual churches, who are considering uh, giving some money towards um, this project to help us get going there. Now, I want you to know that we need your help. That there is a big part to play for each one of us in this. And so I want to ask for your support. I want to ask for your commitment to, to help establishing and extending 
our church into Harvey Bay. One church, two locations. So here's what you can do. I'm going to give you a bit of a list up here and I'm going to talk through this and you, if you've got a, a notepad or you know, want to take a photo of that, um, at some point we might print this out and, and give you each a copy of it. But these are the things that you can do to be a part of this. Um, and I hope that there's one or two or three or even more things that you, you see here today that as we talk through that you go, you know what, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that, I can do that, yes, I, I, I'm going to be a part of that. So he, here they are. Pray for the Harvey Bay campus. Make it a regular part of your prayer list. Pray for the team who will be, you know, like really working a little bit harder every Sunday um, and during the week to make this happen. Pray for those who are a part of the church. Pray for those who, who find us and become a part of the church. Pray for those who will find the Lord through the ministry of that new campus. Pray. There's another thing you can do. You can tell your friends. Tell, tell those people. If you know people in Harvey Bay, tell them your church is coming to Harvey Bay. Tell them we want them to be a part of uh, the Harvey Bay church. Bring them along once we get started. I mean, that would be even better. If you know someone in Harvey Bay who's open to coming to church, not already um, committed to another church, then tell them, I'm going to come and pick you up and I'm going to bring you to our church in Harvey Bay. We would love for you to do that. Okay, next thing, you can share our socials. So, you know, as we put Facebook posts out there, and in fact, if, you haven't or if you're not already following the Life Church Maryborough Facebook page, then if you're on Facebook, look us up, make sure you're following us so that you get all of the um, latest announcements as they come through. But if you see something that says we're starting something in Harvey Bay, then don't just like it. I mean, sure, like it, but don't just like it. Share it, because then your friends see that as well. And we would really appreciate you helping us get the word out through your social networks as well. Um, you can commit to serving. So here's the thing. There will be some people who serve here who will now make Harvey Bay their church home. And we need to fill those gaps here. So if, if you're serving a little bit, maybe you can up your serving. If you're not serving at all, maybe it's time to, to say, you know what, this is my church and being a part of a church means that I serve. What can I do here to contribute to the ministry? So we need, we, we're going to need more service, people serving in different roles here, but we definitely need people serving in Harvey Bay. And so here's the thing that you might choose to do. You might choose to say, you know what, I'm going to make Harvey Bay the place that I serve for the first three months or six months of next year and, uh, and commit to doing that and, and just help us kind of get off the ground there. Because you know what, when you start a church and someone comes along the first week, generally they're not serving that week, right? It takes a little while before they start serving. And so we need some of you guys to, to pitch in and be, you know, ag readers and, and uh, you know, set up team and pack down team and, and, and uh, host uh, team members and so on. So have a think about that. Here's a thought that you might want to, to consider. You might want to consider serving in one and worshipping in one. So you might worship here and serve there, or you might worship there and serve here. And, and then that way you kind of, you're not getting distracted from just being at church to worship by having to serve in a capacity. Do that in one by all means, and then go and just sit and worship in the other. Uh, here's another thought. If you're away for a weekend, um, or sick Sunday morning, or got something else on Sunday morning, then maybe instead of just catching up online later on and, and you know, watching the service... Maybe go to our Harvey Bay campus that day, you know. Didn't get up early enough on Sunday morning to get to Life Church Maryborough, so I'm going to go up to Harvey Bay tonight and go to Life Church Harvey Bay. Finally, God might lay it on your heart to be a part of those who are giving uh, to launch the Harvey Bay project. And uh, so if God does that, then... Uh, we would really value those contributions because uh, really it takes, it takes a lot of money to get a church going. Uh, it takes a while before, you know, there are people who are attending that church and committed to that church enough that they want to financially support that church and there being enough people who are actually there as a part of that church to have that kind of momentum to, to continue going. So, so we're going to be um, asking you to consider sowing into that church there. I'm asking you, Life Church 
I'm asking you, will you join me in following God's call into this new venture? You see, there are people who need Jesus in this community, and there are people who need Jesus in the Harvey Bay community, who will only find them as we reach out to them. They will only find Jesus as we reach out to them together. People who are impoverished, not just because they can't pay their bills, but because they don't know that the Lord of Lords, Jesus the Christ, has already paid their ultimate debt. And so as I look at this story of Gideon, there are a couple of lessons that we need to take away. And uh, they'll come up on the screen here. Firstly, when God invites you into His mission, don't forget that it's His mission. Don't make it yours, don't make it about you. This is His mission. Secondly, when God invites you into His mission, He's looking at your weakness, not your strength. He's looking at your weakness. Let Him be strong. And thirdly, when God invites you into His mission, He will do it. He will do it. He will do it. We can trust Him. Let's have confidence in God and God alone. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, would you just come now and do a deep work within us?